Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you, uh, the organizers, for giving me the opportunity to talk about here to you today about conservation biological control, its scope, and the challenges for further uptake. So or you already know that um, and there are three approaches to conservation biological control, and one of them is um, conservation biological control. And um, classical or importation biological control and augmentative biological control, the, the two talks that we saw already, um, they deal with direct manipulation of the natural enemies. But in the case of conservation biological control, the idea here is to manipulate the environment to provide resources that um, benefit natural enemies so they can do their work better. Um, regarding the scope, I think uh, here it's interesting to um, have the answer to all these questions. First of all, what are the aspects of natural enemies biology that can help their conservation? Which resources do they need for these that probably are not provided by the crop or the agroecosystem? Where, how, and when these resources uh, can or should be delivered? So when we think about what aspects of natural enemies biology can help in their conservation, the most obvious ones that come to mind are their longevity and reproduction, because probably they will relate to their impact in the field. Um, but we also have to think about um, the, oh, I'm one behind, okay. <laughs> but we also have to think about the activity uh, because they have to attack, parasitize, find the host, etc. And also, we must not forget about that these natural enemies have to come in contact with the pests. So it's important to, um, to see how they can immigrate and stay in, uh, in the crop. Um, so all these um, aspects of the biology are important. Now, which resources these, these natural enemies might need for, to express this biology? And here we usually can divide this in two big groups. So one group will be food, some trophic resource that they, know they need uh, besides the best, and then some kind of abiotic or a structural resource. Um, and maybe some of you, I'm one behind, okay. And maybe <laughs> some of you might have, um, heard about this uh, acronym SNAP, with shelter being some kind of abiotic um, resource, nectar and pollen being complementary resources provided by the plant, and then alternative prey or um, some kind of food. Um, but I also think it's good to think about uh, giving natural enemies a healthy environment. So a place where they're not, they do not get killed by other things we do, like applying um, pesticides or uh, having its own competitors over there. And also I think it's good to uh, think about a more generalized type of sugar because there are other sources of sugar for natural enemies in the, that they might use. And also some items might provide more than one resource for natural enemies. For example, here aphids might be an alternative prey but they also may provide some type of sugar for natural enemies or um, some healthy environment because they, um, they free them from competitors, for example. And if we made a little bit of space, I think it's good also to talk about uh, plant volatiles, yeah? Because um, these are important for this immigration and permanence and um, these enemies might also need this for their um, to express their biology and have their impact. Now, if we think about microbial natural enemies, here it's important to maybe not think about pollen or nectar or that, these types of resources because these uh, microbial natural enemies might need some resources that have to do with the soil, uh, abiotic components, and these are the ones that might impact positively their um, survival or their impact, their final impact. Um, okay. Now, where these resources should be delivered? And here we can think of different spatial scales from within the crop to the borders or at the larger or broader landscape scale. And um, usually within the crop and, uh, and in the borders is the scale where farmers do their management. And maybe at the landscape level is where um, uh, maybe some public policy can help. 
next, how these resources should be delivered. And here, there are very many different types of management things that can be done. The most obvious one and the most used ones, or maybe the most known one, is the management of non-crop vegetation, but also some resources can be provided directly, or we can manage some kind of abiotic or structural um, aspects of fields, or also modify harmful practices, like not use broad spectrum pesticides, um, uh, or some cultivation techniques, and uh, we can also do some things to manipulate the crop itself, so um, insects or in natural enemies can have their impact, uh, particularly in terms of volatiles. Next question, when these resources should be delivered? And here the answer is when they need them, when this resource is limited for them. And um, I'm gonna bring this um, parasitoid nectar provision hypothesis um, proposed by Hempel and Jarvis around 20 years ago. And here what they say is like, okay, because modern crops or agroecosystems usually do not, pro do not provide naturally occurring sugars, then if we provide nectar next to the crop, biological control by parasitoids can be improved. Yeah? But for this to happen, some, um, first, the parasitoids need to be sugar limited. Yeah? Uh, second, they have to find and feed on this sugar, be able to feed in the sugar. Then, because they feed on the sugar, then the fecundity gets enhanced and then they can parasitize more, and at the end of the day, they can lower the best pressure. Um, we can generalize this hypothesis to talk about the natural enemy resource provision hypothesis. So here again, we can say modern crops or agroecosystem do not provide some resource that is limited for the natural enemy, and we, if we provide it, then it has expressed its biology and it has more impact. But again, this will depend on the naturally, natural enemy being limited by this resource, using the resource that we give them, and then experience it higher fecundity, longevity, activity, immigration, permanence, yeah? and uh, by the end of it, lowering the pest pressure. So I think this at the bottom is kind of like the heart of conservation biological control, and it helps me set the scene for the second part, <laughs> where I wanna talk about the challenges for further uptake of conservation biological control. And I think here we can think about two types of challenges. One are gaps in knowledge or research regarding a species biology and the interactions do they, that they have, and also um, some needed information that is relevant for farmers. Uh, and of course, they feed into each other. So if we think uh, in the first category, in um, I think it's very important that studies um, have to shift from documenting patterns to evaluating the mechanism, explaining the interactions and the outcomes. And let me, if you were with me, <laughs> let me explain it with an example of what usually gets done. So let's say you wanna improve the longevity and reproduction of a natural enemy by providing them these uh, complementary resources, sugar and pollen, and we're gonna do that in the border of the crop uh, by providing some non-crop vegetation. All this is good, so we choose a plant that has nectar and pollen, but we have to take into consideration that this plant can also provide other, a lot of different resources. Maybe it's a fungi that also serves as food, maybe it's an alternative prey, other sources of sugar, maybe it's a good place to overwinter, maybe it gives them um, a refuge from extreme temperatures, or maybe it's also a healthy environment where it escapes pesticides, where its own natural enemies or competitors are not uh, there. Um, but what happens, what usually uh, most studies do, do is that um, we, we just set an experiment where we put this uh, non-crop vegetation and then we sample uh, natural enemies in this non-crop vegetation. So these experiments are not designed to identify the resources offered by this non-crop vegetation that we saw it can be many of them. And in many studies, we use many different plant species and sometimes we're looking at multiple natural enemies, thinking in multiple target pests, 
And then in this non-crop vegetation, we don't look at what the pest itself, if it uses it, or this fourth trophic level that could be limiting the natural enemies. So at the end, by not identifying and measuring the resources in the vegetation and not assessing their use by the natural enemies, we have no explanation of the patterns we observe. So I think this is a, a shift that we have to do as researchers. And there are ways, uh, different ways to measure uh, the resources if natural enemies use these resources and propose some mechanisms. So different ways to evaluate if they use the food resources or is the refuge is a good refuge and the insects use it. Um, okay, so second, I think it's very important that studies evaluate what are the management effects of these conservation bio biological control measures of the natural enemies in the crop, yeah? Uh, and also the effect on pest control damage or yield, uh, which is usually let, is not done in this type of projects. Um, so if we do this, these first two things, uh, and we understand the mechanism and effects on pests, we can fill some important gaps that we have today, uh, and we, with that we can improve conservation biological control. Okay, we're all good here, but what is the relevant information for farmers? Yeah, they're not worried about necessarily the mechanisms behind. They want, if we want them to up, uh, improve their uptake, then we need to need, uh, generate this information that is relevant for them. And here we come back to this cost-benefit analysis, but we're talking now at the farm level, not at some big uh, biological control project. So what are these costs and benefits? Uh, um, and in the side of cost, we have to acknowledge that establishing and maintaining flower strip, cover crops, hedgerows, implies a cost. And also, the other type of management implies a cost. Yeah. What about in terms of benefits? Well, we need to be able to tell the growers, the farmers, what are the economic benefits in terms of higher yields or lower pests control inputs that they were using before. One interesting thing is that when we use non-crop vegetation management as a technique for conservation biological control, is that we can have many other benefits that are relevant for farmers because these plants might provide uh, several ecosystem services. Of course, the one that we want, control of pests and pathogens, but they also, they might provide other services like flood prevention, climate regulation, erosion control. Um, many of them provide many cultural services. Some of them might have some um, medicinal properties. And of course, some of them also might add some of these other supporting services. Here again, if we know which plant traits that we're using are relevant for the different ecosystem services, then we can create these multifunctional vegetation strips. And this can also be much more attractive for farmers to implement. So if we know what aspects of the flower, for example, uh, promote pollination or pollinator conservation or biological control, and then we know these different aspects, then um, we can select the best plant species to provide several ecosystem services. Um, but I think um, we need to understand uh, well which are the costs and benefits that are more relevant for farmers. And for this, we need multidisciplinary teams. Uh, we also need to understand what, which could be the challenges for adoption. Maybe there's, there's a lot of knowledge that need to adopt this, and this could be a challenge. So this is another interesting thing uh, and challenge that we think we, ha we need to address. So, in conclusion, to make conservation biological control more effective and replicable, we need to fill some gaps in knowledge. To improve its uptake by farmers, we need to understand and generate the information that is relevant for them, which might be different than for, you know, a scientist or a different kind of scientist. <laughs> and, um, but I believe that conservation biological control can increase many aspects of agricultural sustainability and also contribute to many different sustainable development goals. So I hope we can promote this more. Thank you.